Well, hello everyone. Welcome to the third day of the first week of BCI 101 series, co-organized by NeuroTechX community and the Center for Neurobiology and Brain Restoration at Skoltech. Um, on the next week, we'll have uh, we'll have a user experience interview with Fabian Lotte. Three talks about open source by signal processing software and practicing session. Uh, thank you for participation today. We're welcome to BCI series. If this is the first day for you, glad to see those who previously have already been with us. We actually have more than 1,000 registrations, people from five continents, which are enthusiasts, young researchers, specialists in the field, and that's amazing. Uh, today, after the meeting, we are running Neurobar with two rooms, one invasive and uh, a non-invasive one. The announcement will be at the end of this hour. Uh, you will you will be told how to find the link. Uh, use hashtag NTXBCI101. Take photos of you participating in this series. Post it in Instagram or social media tagging your location, Skulltag and Neurotech X. If we have enough photos, we'll create a big one from all of them and send to you after COVID ends. And now please raise a, a hand if you want to be in for a bar today. We just want to see how many of you are going to join us. Yeah, okay, pretty well. And yeah, thank you. Now let me um, give this floor to be more precise and mic to Michael Lebedev, a worldwide renowned neuroscientist who is working in the BCI field, currently focusing on electrocorticography based interfaces in humans. Many of you know him because of his brilliant scientific articles and talks. And today we ask him to put an accent on the most important neurophysiological aspects relevant to neurotech and BCI fields. Michael, could you please turn on your video and take a mic? Yeah, hello. Hello. Uh, well, this virtual floor is yours. Okay. Thank you very, thank you very much, Matvey. Thank you for the invitation. It is a great honor for me to present here. So, uh, start by sharing my screen, and here we go. So today I will talk about this neurophysiology basis of brain machine interfaces. And uh, um, I will give an overview of brain machine interfaces. Of course, I cannot cover everything, especially that uh, I have just 45 minutes to talk and then we have neuro bar, which is important. So if I do not mention something, this does not mean that I did it intentionally, just um, I talk about what I know best. So what is... Uh, Well, ah, yeah. What is our goal here? So our goal here is uh, to beat Elon Musk. Of course, uh, unless he participates in this meeting, my understanding is that he got an invitation, but I don't know if he received it or responded it to it. So. Um, Elon Musk actually wrote a paper recently um, where he is an author and Neuralink is the second author. So looking closely, uh, when I look closely at this paper, this makes me kind of proud because um, I see familiar phrases like here, Th this sounds familiar. Uh, this is so familiar, and um, I, I found the same phrase in my previously published uh, paper. So I guess this gives some additional credibility to my talk. And uh, let me start with uh, explaining what a brain machine interface is. So brain machine interface is a system that connects to the brain, records brain activity. Uh, <clears throat> You try to record as much um, uh, from as much areas as you can. Then uh, this uh, recording is sent to a decoder, 
which may be very complex. It can be a brain by itself, like artificial neural network. And uh, this decoder um, extracts some interesting pieces of information from the recorded brain activity. In this case, these are commands that are sent to a robotic arm. So this robotic arm moves um, driven by cortical activity of the subject. Uh, this is needed for people, for paralyzed people, um, for control of uh, such um, uh, robotic prost uh, prosthetic devices. And then uh, this uh, robotic uh, hand uh, can be sensorized and the activity from the sensors of this uh, robotic arm could be sent back to the brain to close the loop and to create artificial sensations. So uh, some recommended reading. So you can read, for example, um, our review with Miguel Nicarellis in Physiological Reviews. Uh, it is pretty recent, 2017. Or you could read uh, this 2006 um, review in Trends of Neurosciences. So from this review, there is a classification of brain machine interfaces how we saw them at the time. And you can see that uh, we are very, very biased to um, invasive interfaces. So many, many boxes that uh, describe different types of invasive interfaces, uh, in interfaces and just um, one box for non-invasive interfaces. So I will try not to be as biased as, biased as here, but uh, still um, just by, uh, by um, my previous occupation, probably I will be still biased. So also it is important to mention that in Russia, uh, bi bioelectrical interfaces has been studied since uh, 1970s. So in this book edited by Viktor Gorfinkel, um, you can see a description of different bi bioelectrical systems. So this is in Russian, but I will tell you that they thought about bi bioelectrical systems that are controlled by skeletal potentials of skeletal muscles, then by heart muscle or by electrical activity of the brain. And they say that at that time, uh, Soviet scientists had a priority in this field. So a few illustrations from this um, book. So this is a bioelectrical prosthesis of the hand uh, developed by uh, Russian scientists. And here is, a, I guess, a very, very important test of this uh, pr prosthetic hand. So also they mention a, an in interface, how we call it now, for um, controlling a ventilator, which is also urge um, urgent uh, currently. So in this case, um, a, a patient with, um, with a disabled function of um, lungs so, um, he received an interface that um, samples activity of uh, the muscles of the chest, and then uh, the uh, EMG activity um, of these muscles of the chest trigger the ventilator. Uh, next example from the same book is a bioelectrical control of a device that uh, delivers uh, narcotic drugs, but uh, this is not like for drug addicts, uh, this is for uh, keeping um, a patient anesthetized. And uh, um, uh, also I found in this book a very interesting interface that controls an electrode inserted in the brain and it makes sure that the recordings of the neuron are good. Uh, finally, they talk about these um, interfaces that connect to the brain itself and then they discuss uh, the usage of EEG signal for this purpose. And they mention uh, two, two camps of scientists. So one camp, um, they are overly optimistic about EEG and they are saying that we just need the better um, decoding algorithms and then we can in, in, in extract from the EEGs whatever you want. And the other group of scientists uh, are very skeptical about, about EEG because they say that EEG is just a um, combined um, potential um, of billions of neurons. So uh, EEG is not so informative. 
of course we have the same situation now so this this question is still not resolved uh, now let's switch to invasive interfaces and this is a depiction of a monkey version of an invasive interface uh, here a monkey is implanted in the brain with many electrodes the monkey is playing a video game while the monkey is playing this video game the activity of these neurons is recorded then decoded and at some point um, the, the monkey's joystick can be disconnected and then the monkey starts to play this game uh, simply by thinking about it directly by the activity of many many cortical neurons so why use monkeys uh, there is a controversy about using monkeys in research but uh, but also um, Recently in PNS, there was an issue um, explaining why, why we need monkeys for research. And there are many, many uh, fields of research where monkeys are needed before something can be tested in humans. And particularly what I will be talking about is restoring motor and sensory function. So I, I think still uh, it is good that um, studies are being done um, in humans, but um, in many cases, this is premature and we need, we need animal experiments to test different types of brain machine interfaces. Uh, and here is the monkey brain, by the way, this is the front of the brain here. This is the back of the brain. This is the central sulcus, motor cortex in front of the central sulcus, some other sensory cortex behind the central sulcus and premotor cortex. Prefrontal cortex monkeys use this um, small piece of their brain for thinking. In humans, prefrontal cortex is much larger. So there are areas that, that represent legs, arms, face. They, uh, um, there are also re representations of the eyes. So there are many places where we could um, put our electrodes and try to extract useful information. So uh, the monkey brain is pretty close to the human brain. The human brain also has a central sulcus. Uh, uh, then the frontal lobe, parietal lobe. And uh, mm, the areas that are located in the frontal lobe are, uh, could be called motor areas. And the ones in the parietal lobe could be called sensory areas. Uh, but um, this distinction is kind of uh, relative be because at every level of cortical organizations, th there is a um, communication be between sensory and motor areas. So motor areas have sensory information and sensory areas have motor information. Curiously, back in 1876, Ferrier had a very similar depiction of the organization of the brain where there are motor areas at different levels of the central nervous system and sensory areas. And there are communications at each area, at each level. So um, uh, invasive uh, research um, in monkeys, how we know it, started with the experiments of Edwards Evers, who um, experimented with awake behaving monkeys, and he inserted an electrode in the monkey brain, the monkey was awake and behaving. And in this case, the monkey um, was um, operating a, a lever. Or uh, to give you a, an, another example of Everest's experiment here, the monkey was rotating its wrist. And you can see that the, um, when the monkey changes the position of its wrist, then, uh, then the activity of this uh, motor cortical neuron changes. So just look by looking at the activity of this cortical neuron, you can uh, guess in what position the wrist is. So you can decode even just by looking at this uh, slide. Uh, of course, just rotating the wrist is not enough. We need more degrees of freedom, more dimensions, more directions. So in neurophysiology, typically eight uh, directions of movements are used. And uh, Apostles Georgiopoulos is the one who started these experiments where, where monkeys moved uh, the joystick in eight possible directions. And in this particular case, you can see that when the monkey moves the lever to the left, then there is a high activity of this neuron. When the monkey moves 
the uh, the level to the right there is little activity in, in this cortical neuron uh, um, I would like also to compare um, these with what we see with non-invasive interfaces. So typically in non-invasive interfaces, when uh, a subject moves, then there is no activity. They say that activity got desynchronized. Uh, not the case with uh, invasive interfaces. Uh, beautiful activity, uh, well recorded, and you can use it for decoding. Uh, by, by the way, this is... Um, this is a picture of uh, GR Jopels, and this is a picture of me. Uh, if you can see it, I am not sure if you can see it, but I guess this this is supposed to give uh, even more credibility to my present talk. So, and since um, we assume that I am credible here, I would put forward a principle. So the principle is um, the following. Any neurophysiological finding can be converted into brain machine interface finding. So let me give you some examples from my own work. And this is the work that I did with Randy Nelson. So in these experiments, uh, the, monkey, the monkey's uh, hand received vibration. And when vibration started, the monkey moved in its hand. Uh, if you look at this activity more closely, then you see that uh, the monkey primary cement sensory cortex neurons respond to both vibrations. So there is a response to each vibratory pulse. And there is also a peri-movement activity. So this vibratory um, in, induced activity is mixed with um, the response associated with movement. So Immediately, you can guess that from this type of activity, you can uh, decode both uh, sensory related and motor related signals. Uh, another example of um, cortical activity, in this case, the, these are oscillatory neurons in the somatic sensory cortex. So these uh, neurons have re remarkably consistent interspike intervals. So they basically fire at the same frequency. And so in the autocorrelation histograms, they have this uh, periodic peaks of activity. So uh, these neurons, I speculated at some point that they are in cortical interneurons and uh, they, they are, um, in, their activity is inhibited during movements. So if we use oscillations for decoding, then these kind of neurons could be useful. Uh, also, oscillatory neurons can be found in premotor cortex. So this work I did with Steve Weiss. And uh, these premotor cortical neurons are also oscillatory, but they are, um, they are oscillations of, are of a different kind compared to the somatic sensory cortical neurons. Uh, in this case, the oscillations are clearly induced. And I will not go into all the details of this, but in the so-called joint interspike interval histogram, you can see this diagonal band, which um, uh, proves that oscillations of these neurons occur because they are part of a more global oscillatory system. Uh, by the way, in this experiment, an instructed delay task was used, uh, which um, I think is very uh, useful in brain machine in interface experiments. And maybe it is not even enough used in humans. So in the monkey version, the monkey receives an instruction to move to the left or to the right or up or down, but the monkey is not allowed to move and it has to wait. While the monkey is waiting, not moving at all, uh, th there are still changes in cortical activity and you could use those changes for decoding. Uh, okay, and finally, you can even induce uh, illusions in monkeys. So in this um, experiment with uh, Steve Weiss and other colleagues, the, uh, the monkey was uh, looking at the screen and the, um, the monkey was sitting in the darkness looking at the screen. There was a, a light spot at the center of the screen and, uh, screen and there was a frame. And then at some point, both the central target or the frame could move. And because of the movement of, of the frame, illusion was evoked. 
and the monkey had to report what it what kind of movement it perceived by looking at the corner of the uh, frame and the experiment was designed in such a way that the movements of the eyes illusion and real movements of the spot could be decoupled so to make this study a uh, story short we found neurons that uh, uh, res uh, reflected not what um, what actually occurred with the light spot or um, where the monkey moved the eyes but they reflected the true um, perception perception of the monkey they um, reflected the illusion that the monkey um, experienced so um, what does this tell us this tells us that we could probably decode both conscious and um, unconscious information contained in the brain so how to decode information let me give you another example of a um, cortical cell so here the cortical cell is modulated in some way and each horizontal line represents uh, activity of the cell each dot is a spike of a neuron and you can notice that the activity of this neuron on every trial is very interesting so it is very um, uh, it looks kind of noisy and random but maybe there is some information in in exact timing when this um, neuron discharges so could be, could it be a morse code of some sort and in in principle it could and uh, i've seen many papers where sort of a code is suggested um, for neuronal firing these papers didn't become very popular but but still there, um, there exists a possibility that um, temporal um, structure of neuronal firing carries very important information unfortunately we do not know yet what kind of information it is and um, let me des descri describe um, the, the more typical ways how we are trying to decode information from brain activity one principle spatial decoding and it is based on the fact that there is a homunculus in the brain a, a funny guy with a large face and a small trunk large hands so basically if i think about my hand then the hand area of my cortex is, is activated if i think about my foot then the foot area is activated so by looking where activity occurs in the brain one could decode um, information so this is spatial decoding and uh, it's it is very, very typical for fMRI studies for example in this case uh, depending on what kind of pictures the subject observed um, indoor animals land animals or cars or birds then uh, activity occurred in different places in the brain so it it could be used for decoding um, uh, the visual images uh, from, from the human brain uh, another principle that uh, could be used for decoding is the principle of grandmother cells grandmother cell is a very specialized cell that responds to uh, only to your grandmother and if you dig the history of these cells probably jerry letwin was the first who described uh, grandmother uh, cells and um, he made up a story of a neurosurgeon akaki akakievich who um, first removed all mother cells in his patients and after he removed each and every one of the mother cells in the patient then the patient couldn't uh, remember his mother at all so given the success of this experiment uh, Akaki Akakievich shifted to studying grandmother cells uh, mirror neurons are pretty famous but they are also kind of grandmother cells because uh, they are very specialized and they're supposed to reflect um, absorbed or ex executed um, actions and actually it is um, relatively surprising that in the brain machine interface field mirror neurons are not uh, not so popular as they are in the other literature uh, 
the opposite um, opinion to the grandmother cells or specialized cells are neuronal ensembles. So um, there are certain principles. So you, you can read uh, once again this, uh, this review on, um, on uh, neuronal ensembles by Miguel Nicolelis and me. And you can find principles of neuronal ensembles there. So the first principle is distributed uh, coding, which, which means that um, uh, the representations of any behavioral parameters are distributed in the brain. Then single neuron insufficiency, insufficiency. Basically, if you want to decode, one neuron is not enough. Then multitasking, each neuron multitasks different kinds of information. Mass effect principle, basically the more neurons you record, the better your decoding becomes, but at some point your decoding stabilizes. Then degeneracy principle stating that um, the same result could be produced by different assemblies of neurons. For example, neurons one, two, three or one, two, five could produce the same behavior. Plasticity, conservation of fire, uh, firing and context principle. So probably the first um, uh, investigator who convinced um, others that uh, populations of neurons are important was Georgiopoulos. He recorded many cortical cells then combined the activity in the population vector and used the population vector to predict to predict movement uh, trajectories in three dimensions. However, there was um, a problem here. And the problem was that uh, Georgiopoulos recorded just one or two cells at a time. And uh, he needed many months of recordings to construct uh, such a curve that showed that the accuracy of decoding improves with the cell number. Uh, of course, if we want to decode in real time, we, we cannot uh, record just one cell. We need to record many cells at a time. And John Lilly was the first investigator who started recording, uh, implanting multiple electrodes in the, mon uh, in the monkey cortex. He um, recorded, um, uh, he implanted uh, 100 or more um, electrodes in the monkey brain. But uh, uh, at that time, uh, computers were not so good, so he couldn't um, decode this activity. Miguel Nicolales and John Chapin started a new chapter in this research uh, as they implanted rats with uh, tens or hundreds of electrodes, and uh, they showed that um, activity of these neurons can be decoded. Nowadays, you can implant such multi-electrodes arrays even in the human brain, this is a UTA array. Um, so uh, around the world, I think tens of patients have received um, this, um, this implant. Uh, uh, these are um, types of electrodes that we use for monkeys. These are stages of monkey surgery. So here the craniotomy is made in the skull and then the multi-electrode array is implanted in the brain. Then everything is sealed with dental cement and the monkey gets the uh, nice monkey cap with the connectors sticking out. So all what we have to do at this point is just to um, connect our recording equipment and start recording from the monkey. This is a more advanced monkey cap. It is 3D printed and inside um, this cap there, there is a, a multi-channel a wireless recording system made by Tim Hansen. So now the monkey can even not sit in the monkey chair, but be free and um, behave as it wants. And uh, if we are lucky, if, if the surgery worked, if everything is okay, then on our um, computer screen, we have um, this type of activity. So here each uh, wavy line is a, uh, it corresponds to one neuron. In this particular case, we have 394 neurons recorded simultaneously. Just to prove uh, that this is real, here is a video that I made during uh, one of our experiments. In this experiment, the monkey controlled two 
virtual oven simultaneously, and you, you can see that uh, three computer screens are, um, are covered by immense brain activity. Now we are recording from so many neurons and we need to decode uh, the, uh, the information that they carry. So how, how do we do this? And uh, for this, we um, are interested in some parameter, time t, for example, arm position. Then we look back at the uh, activity of the neurons. Um, typically, one second of previous activity is used. And then uh, activity of the neurons is multiplied by weights. And, and the sum of uh, uh, these activities gives you the parameter of interest. So this is called a linear model. A more advanced model is a Kalman filter. It performs even better. And then you could improve the Kalman filter. So uh, uh, Zhong Li did this uh, with um, an uncentered Kalman filter, which take um, into account nonlinear relationship between uh, neuronal activity and arm movements. Uh, so to give you the current state of the art, here, uh, here are several um, uh, several decoding alg algorithms. So uh, here on, on the left uh, is how the monkey performs manually. In the middle is the performance of a deep learning method, uh, LSTM. And on the right, there is an uncentered Kalman filter performance. So if you look carefully, you, you will realize that LSTM overperforms the uncentered Kalman filter. So um, decoding algorithm, algorithms have uh, room for improvement and uh, there, there is really hope if we have um, good quality neuronal recordings, then with good neuronal alg algorithms, we can uh, approach the level um, of um, normal performance when we decode. So uh, let me give you a brief history of invasive interfaces because it is interesting. It has all started in the 70s when Carl Frank um, from NIH uh, said that he will connect uh, the brain to um, prosthetic devices and maybe even computers. Then they did the first study where the monkey was moving the uh, wrist and they used a linear model to decode wrist movements from neural activity offline. Then at the same time, Fetz um, did his experiments on operant conditioning of, um, of a few cortical uh, neurons. In, in his case, the monkey learned to um, uh, modulate the activity of uh, single uh, cortical neurons uh, to receive rewards. So, so the, the, this is um, now we would call it a brain machine interface, but um, Fetz chose to use this apparent, um, uh, use uh, the um, words apparent conditioning at this point. Then the famous experiment by Chapin, Nicolelis, and their colleagues, uh, where a rat uh, was uh, controlling um, a robot and the robot delivered uh, water. Uh, to the mouth of this rat. So actually, uh, mm, this uh, experiment opened a new, mm, a new development in brain machine interface. And after this study, they developed exponentially. So um, mm, Westberg um, and his colleagues in uh, Nicolai's lab, they mm, developed the first interface in owl monkeys. After that, uh, other groups started to compete uh, with Nicolelis and John Donahue showed an, an interface in macaque monkeys. Uh, Andrew Schwartz showed three-dimensional control in macaque monkeys. Andy Schwartz showed the control of a robot. And then uh, another famous paper was published where a monkey controlled the reach and grasp movements performed by a robotic arm. So th this is actually a video from this experiment. Here, this is a monkey, this is the monkey um, arm, and the, the monkey is moving the joystick and then squeezing it to, um, to mimic a reach and grasp movement. 
So the monkey is doing very well, receiving the rewards. Activity is recorded from the monkey cortex. And then uh, the, uh, at, uh, when we come to brain control here, the joystick is actually disconnected from the screen. And uh, it is monkey's cortical activity uh, that controls the movement of, of the, uh, in this case, the course on the screen. So you can see that the movements of the course became noisier, uh, but still the monkey manages. So it is a typical situation that a brain machine interface operates, but it doesn't operate as well as we normally do. So probably the the next crucial development will happen uh, when we, uh, these brain machine interfaces reach the level of our normal performance. So um, this is a complicated slide, so I will not go into all the details, but uh, the, um, the basic message is that um, a very different situation we have when the monkey is not allowed to assist itself with hand movements. So, so you can control in, an interface, but still move the hands a little bit. And this helps. But if the monkey is not doing that, then the patterns of activity change dramatically. And this is called a, mm, like a true, true brain machine interface control, the, uh, the, um, the control without hand movements. So, um, Many, many researchers wanted to do this because this condition mimics the conditions of a paralyzed patient who cannot assist himself with hand movements. Uh, but also one should remember that you cannot really, um, you can teach your experimental animal not to move the arms, but still there is a possibility that the spinal cord will be involved as shown in this um, experiment by um, Prut and Fetz, where, where the monkey performed uh, an instructed delay task. And during the instructed delay, the monkey didn't move its arms, but still they observed uh, a lot of um, activity in the spinal cord. So uh, after the success of these monkey experiments, uh, Danuchy and Schwarz groups uh, demonstrated control of um, of a robotic um, arm uh, by paralyzed humans implanted with invasive uh, arrays, implanted with UTA arrays. And uh, an additional developments um, came from the experiments where they connected the monkey brain to a stimulator that stimulated uh, muscles of the monkey this experiment from the FETS lab and uh, this experiment from Lee Miller lab. And uh, a similar, ex similar experiments have been done in humans. Here, a human with a non-invasive interface is uh, stimulating his own hand and can uh, grasp objects. More recently, this was demonstrated in humans with um, invasive interfaces. So now let's switch to interfaces for locomotion. So um, in, with locomotion, there is a long history. So by some kind of tradition, all serious researchers of locomotion would um, take an animal like a cat. And then the first thing they would do, they would uh, cut off the brain or cortex and just throw it away is not so um, important part and then study different um, brain stem or spinal centers that control locomotion. And indeed this looks uh, remarkable in a cat because a disreberated cat can walk like in this video, particularly if this disreberated cat is uh, stimulated in a locomotion region. So, this has been studied for many, many years, but this was not so good for us, particularly when we tried uh, to publish our first paper on a um, brain machine interface um, for locomotion were recorded uh, from the cortex. Uh, so we received um, a lot of resistance from this locomotion uh, researchers 
who um, asked why didn't you use all our previous um, spinal cord data. So some help came from the experiments of uh, Belozereva and Sirota. They recorded from cats and they recorded from cortex. And they asked the cats to do um, difficult locomotion tasks. And they found that for difficult locomotion cats, uh, these cortical cells were really activated during locomotion. So this was good news for us. And this is our first sketch of a brain machine interface for locomotion. It is, looks uh, pretty futuristic because I made it for DARPA. Here, a rat is looking at a computer screen and controlling a quadrupedal robot. And actually, we advanced with these experiments. Here is a picture of a rat on a treadmill. And here is the decoding of rat lag EMGs from rat cortical activity. But more interesting experiments were done in monkeys, of course. So we, uh, like Japanese trainers, we trained monkeys to walk on the treadmill. We had two monkeys in this experiment, both uh, walked on a treadmill. And here is a video, how a monkey walks. This monkey is on a treadmill. Flores and Marcus are placed on the joints so we can video track the monkey's movement. And the sound was uh, the sound of a single cortical neuron recorded in the monkey motor cortex. So now this is the same monkey. Let me remove the first. So the same monkey, uh, but now we are recording the activity from this monkey. And uh, blue is the monkey's real leg. Red is what we decode from the cortex. And you can see that there is a good correspondence um, between uh, the real leg position and uh, the one decoded from cortical activity. So uh, this was done with the linear model, but I'm sure that with a better model, we can reach even a better decoding uh, level. Uh, also notice that the decoding is very fast, not like in, in non-invasive interfaces where sometimes you ha uh, have to wait several seconds to get just one bit of information. So um, the next step that we did, we connected our monkey in, in, in Durham, North Carolina, to a humanoid robot that was in uh, Kyoto, Japan. So Gordon Cheng um, and Mitsu Kawata uh, uh, co controlled this robot. And this is one of the experiments. We are sending them uh, monkey cortical activity and monkey cortical activity controls the movement of this humanoid robot. So why is this needed? It is actually very needed because currently there is a rise of exoskeletons which um, are built in uh, uh, Europe, in Russia, in, um, in um, New Zealand. And uh, in, in Brazil, uh, this uh, person with an in, in exalton opens the World, World Cup. So there is a hope that soon paralyzed people will no longer use their wheelchairs and they will use um, um, exoskeletons. What if they could control these exoskeletons by their cortical activities? This could be good. Actually, this has been done already. Uh, by several groups, but here is um, a control uh, created by Alexei Sachi, Nikolai Smitanin, Alexander Kuznetsov, the great Russian scientists. And here, uh, a paralyzed person is in uh, exathlet. And here, uh, uh, this person commands uh, the exoskeleton to start moving or not to move, depending on the instruction that he gets. So, um, this EEG-controlled exoskeleton doesn't work as well as a potentially uh, invasive interface, but um, we believe that it will be really uh, useful for neurorehabilitation of these um, paralyzed people. Uh, so let's, yeah, let's now um, switch to um, uh, sensorized brain-machine interfaces. 
uh, we call them brain machine brain interfaces because uh, in this case uh, an animal or human subject can, um, can sends motor commands uh, to uh, to this um, interface and also receives sensations so in this case a monkey had a virtual hand on the screen and it moved uh, the virtual hand by uh, cortical activity at the same time when the virtual hand touched different objects then um, artificial tactile information was sent to the monkey's brain so um, let me give you a video from here so in this case the monkey assists it um, uh, um, controls the movement of this hand with brain activity correct target is only for us the monkey didn't uh, uh, have this help but it um, operated this hand very quickly because each time the hand touched the target the monkey received stimulation in the primary somatosensory cortex uh, here is an, um, the next development in this um, experiment here the monkey touched virtual gratings uh, with uh, a virtual finger controlled by brain activity so it looked like this so on the left is the monkey view two gray rectangles which the monkey rubs with the virtual uh, finger to determine the texture on the right is the correct answer green is the correct uh, correct um, answer um, colored in green in green for our convenience the monkey didn't see the color so but it very successfully used um, uh, this artificial tactile sense uh, to determine the density of the gratings so in this case actually the monkey is using a joystick but in this case this is a true brain machine brain interface because the movements of the monkey's fingers are controlled by brain activity directly and this can be done also by a human subject in, uh, um, here, um, Maria Valodina in our laboratory in Russia is uh, demonstrating this interface. So very similar to the um, active touch that I showed for monkeys. And uh, basically what she's doing is uh, rubbing um, virtual uh, targets and determining the texture. In this case, the uh, sensation is delivered by electrical stimulation of, of the skin. I should uh, mention the work of Sliman Ben Smaya, who even had um, Barack Obama visit um, uh, his lab. And here, uh, here uh, the subject, the paralyzed subject, received um, uh, stimulation in the somatosensory, somatosensory cortex. And this way, he, um, his sense of touch was restored. Uh, and just recently, an experiment um, on artificial sensations was um, published. Here, uh, they did an in interesting thing. They uh, stimulated a paralyzed uh, hand, recorded activity from motor cortex, and then send uh, these decoded sensations back to the subject's um, arm, and the sensations were delivered using vibration. So uh, curiously, they decoded um, uh, sensations from the motor cortex, but this is not a great uh, surprise for us because uh, Solomon Shakur and his colleagues have shown that when you stimulate the monkey's hand, then you get responses everywhere for both in primary sem somatosensory cortex and in the motor cortex. So uh, let's now shift to non-invasive interfaces. They were started probably in 1975 with the work of Jack Vidal. Uh, Niels Berbaumer first demonstrated the um, non-invasive interface for spelling in paralyzed people. He used slow cortical potentials for, for, um, for this um, spelling device. Uh, then motor imagery interfaces are quite popular here a subject has to imagine movement and uh, desynchronization occurs in uh, one part of the sensory motor cortex and it can be detected uh, similar uh, desynchronization has been ob observed in monkeys 
and uh, um, north, um, north fin fats um, also observed um, oscillations of this sort during movements. So, and I haven't seen a similar brain machine interface paper in humans uh, that would mimic the work of north fin fats. Uh, Alexey Sachi made a great contribution to this field by showing that um, oscillations have a very interesting structure. So a human subject cannot really control an average amplitude of these oscillations. What it can, he can control is the rate of occurrence of um, oscillatory episodes, but it is very hard to control the duration of the oscillatory episode. And then I made a little bit of contribution by showing that as, um, oscillatory cells in premotor cortex have directional sensitivity. So uh, some sobering statement that facts are the air of scientists and artifacts are the bread of scientists. Indeed, in many non-invasive um, interfaces, particularly commercial ones sold for entertainment, there are lots of artifacts and they are not so often controlled. But there are types of uh, interfaces that uh, are robust to artifacts. For example, P300 interface, where in, in brain responses are triggered by uh, external visual stimulus. Or a similar idea is a steady state visual um, potential interface. Here, the subject has several uh, targets on the screen each flashes at its own frequency and the, if the subject attends to one of the targets uh, this can be mm, decoded but by analyzing the spectrum the g spectrum uh, also fmri can be used for decoding so it, it is doable and functional near infrared spectroscopy can be used for brain machine interfaces uh, this, this implementation is interesting because one can use mental arithmetics uh, to control a brain machine interface. Uh, now we come to this minimally invasive method called electrocorticography, where electrodes are put uh, on the surface of the brain. This is what we do at our Center for Bioelectrical Interfaces of, um, of the Higher School of Economics. Uh, so uh, we published a review on decoding from electrocorticographic activity. I recommend reading this review. And the idea is that we can use um, an eco grid, uh, basically for two purposes: for decoding motor commands and for delivery of uh, sensory signals to the brain using electrical stimulation. And this work was only possible but because the best neurosurgeon in Russia, Vladimir Krylov, uh, opened a lab in his, um, uh, at his clinic for us. The head of this lab is Mikhail Sinkin. And uh, they do um, surgery in epileptic patients. They implant uh, electrocorticographic uh, grids for medical reasons. And we use these grids, uh, so we ask these patients to participate in some simple experiments. There, all the right equipment is used for, for these experiments. Uh, Nikolai Smitanin wrote uh, like the best in the world uh, software for this kind of experiments. It is called NFB Lab, and uh, here is the publication on this. The software is freely available. You can download it and here is a video from these experiments here is a, um, an epileptic person performs a finger movement task or here he performs um, a center out task uh, like in the early work of georgiopoulos but uh, unlike uh, georgiopoulos uh, studies the su subject uses a, a pen to perform this um, central task. And we hope that in the, in the future, we could be even de um, be able to decode handwriting. And here, uh, 
the subject performs a central task with rotations also also first um, found in Georgiopoulos work. Uh, another, in this case, this is a real time control. So this, this person is able to um, control the movements of a virtual finger uh, by, by electrocorticographic activity uh, at any pace very quickly. So it works really fast. So pretty good. And now we are moving to um, bidirectional interfaces. So I should also mention that if you want to develop uh, decoders, it's you're not obligated to use uh, uh, cortical activity. You can use just electrical activity of muscles, like in this study uh, where we decoded handwriting from the activity of forearm and hand muscles, and we decoded the um, written uh, characters very nicely, especially when. Uh, Elizaveta Okorakova, she developed this Kalman filter that uh, performed this decoding really well. And uh, also uh, a discrete, uh, discrete decoding algorithm could be used for decoding handwriting. Moreover, the CMG activity can be used to control a virtual piano. So if you feel like uh, a different way of expressing yourself in music. So you can use this uh, uh, um, EMG driven interface that uh, plays music. And also I'm like running out of time. So I very briefly mentioned that there exist other promising methods. So and the vascular electrodes uh, um, here, electrodes are inserted in blood vessels, uh, do not penetrate the brain. This is quite promising. The neural dust can be used for decoding. And even optical imaging, if it uh, becomes um, safe for subject at some point. So now I, I will really quickly go through these um, Prospective interfaces that you, that use reward um, um, responsive activity of the brain or motivation related signals. So I will use my work um, in Steve Wise's lab to illustrate the point. So here the monkey uh, was sitting in a kind of a monkey restaurant where it was offered uh, food from different directions. And in one case, it was offered food from the robot, but it was not as simple as in a, as in a human restaurant, because in the human restaurant, you just uh, come there and you get the food. Here, the monkey had to uh, attempt to robot movements. And there was also a rule, like you attempt to the robot, but get the food in the other place, and then the rule could change. So for the monkey, it was complicated. But um, I will not go into all the complexities of this task. I will just mention that uh, we could represent uh, activity of these neurons by this four by four matrix where rows of the matrix corresponded to the position of uh, one piece of food uh, and the, 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 the columns corresponded to the position of these pieces of food placed in the robot. So then by looking at this diagram, we could um, guess what this neuron represents. In this case, the neuron represents robot position because you have this uh, column of activity, of high activity of this neuron. And uh, like this column of activity, red is high activity, represents the robot. If, if this is um, uh, um, horizontal line, then this is food placed in a different um, location. So um, now let's look at uh, the moment when the food is just gets to the place. At this uh, point, uh, the, the monkey doesn't uh, move. It just observes the food offered to it. And you can see that this cortical neuron responds to the food. And the response is uh, stronger than what happens when the monkey actually grabs the food for this neuron and also for this neuron. So this neuron responds to the food 
in pretty much the same in different conditions. And the other neuron is inhibited when the monkey is offered food. Uh, but then we get more compl complicated uh, neurons where the neuron responds to the food, but responds differently depending on, um, on the food location. Say you have a, like a glass of wine on the red and then a pizza on the right, and then you change the, the locations and th this matters for this neuron. Moreover, uh, there are neurons that um, reflect what the monkey is going to do. Say you have a glass of wine on the right and the pizza on the left, but your plan is just to take the glass of wine first, ignore pizza. Then uh, th this kind of a complex um, neuron will uh, represent your intention. And uh, th th this neuron is also um, of this kind. So, so here we have this kind of a mark, uh, monkey neuroeconomics by recording um, activity from the monkey brain. We figure out what the monkey wants to do as a consumer, which is quite different from the statement of Pavlov, who uh, at, uh, once said that we shouldn't go into the internal state of an animal. So we should be very objective. So. This was not so true. And uh, just to finish this, let me show you some futuristic inter inter interfaces. And um, one is a brain to brain interface developed by Miguel Faiz Vieira. And in this case, two rats communicated with each other. One performed the task and the other signaled the performance to the other. The signal was delivered to uh, the red brain using cortical stimulation. And also there was a feedback loop. If the uh, receiver understood the message, then uh, the first thread uh, got, got an additional reward. So this way, the first thread mm, learned to think more clearly and transmits, uh, transmit its brain activity very clearly. Then we have this brain plus brain interface where monkeys cooperate and controlling a virtual hand. Two monkeys can do this, or even three monkeys can do this. In this three monkey uh, case, uh, each monkey had a two dimensional screen, but they all together act acted as a super brain that controlled three dimensional movements of uh, a virtual hand. With some examples from these experiments, this is a two monkey task. Uh, red is one monkey. Blue is another monkey, uh, black is them together. And you can see that um, two monkeys perform be better than one. And here three monkeys perform together. So blue, green, and red are monkey pairs and the black is all them together. Uh, it is curious that in this uh, experiment, uh, one monkey can take a, a break, stop working, but the, the, the interface is robust for this and the other monkey, um, the two good working monkeys can still do the task. And this finishes my talk. So hopefully I didn't run over time too much and we still have uh, time for, uh, for this uh, neuro bar. And let me remove this. Okay. I cannot hear you. Uh, Matvey, I cannot hear you. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay, <laughs> now we can. I have already started speaking, but yeah, just feel like thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, th I just thanked you, Mikhail, and uh, my apologies to the public because we are a bit uh, out of time, but I really couldn't interrupt you. Uh, seems to be that we were too optimistic to put everything in one hour. Uh, before we go to Q&A, let Brian make a, sh a short announcement about uh, Neurobar. Uh, just, uh, Brian, can you please turn on your video? Yeah, yeah. Great, thank you, Matt Bay, and thank you everybody to, for attending today. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the event. My name is Brian Jenkins. I am reporting 
in isolation from behind the scenes here in Canada. Uh, so as Matze has mentioned, we are going to host a social, our Neurobar, after this call. Uh, so grab a drink. It could be water, tea, uh, beer, or vodka. And uh, if you join our Slack, I'll share a link shortly in the chat to join our Slack. You can um, head to our BCI 101 channel where we will share the link for you to join our social. Uh, so come join us, hang out with the NeurotechX community, and uh, we'll see you soon. Thanks again for joining. Yeah, don't also forget to participate in posting some photographs in social media with the hashtags and mentioning of NeuroTechX and Skoltech who helped, who were uh, co-organizers for this event. Now, Mikhail, if you don't mind, let's go to questions. We have sure. plenty mm -hmm. of them. Some of them are in the chat below. Uh, I just put a short poll from your side to our, uh, to our uh, participants about the cautions and brain machine interfaces. Uh, let's go for a chat first and then I ask a few questions more. Uh, can you go to the chat? Uh, okay. Yeah, there is a Q&A session down. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and now you see it. Okay, so is it, yeah, is it? well to, mm, so, uh, how many questions do I have? Uh, is it possible to create a very complex decoder in invasive BCIs with spiking LFP that the subject is able to learn in operant learning parody? How much complexity is too much? So um, for, um, for monkeys, it is always um, apparent conditioning. So they always uh, work for reward. Uh, for humans, you can just um, ask. Uh, a human um, to uh, um, like to do the task, but uh, but the reward is still there because the human wants to do the task correctly. So the answer is yes. So what is the next question? Okay, uh, as a neuroradiologist, I wonder if there are interfaces based on magnetic resonance imaging or just EEG and EMEG? Yes, there are in interfaces uh, based on magnetic, re magnetic resonance imaging. Uh, I mentioned, by the way, one in my talk. Mm -hmm. So they are relatively slow, but they are powerful because the MRI has access to all brain areas. Also, um, EG based and EMEG based. And uh, e at our School of Economics, Alexey Asadji is developing MEG based interfaces, very powerful. He can decode movements of single fingers. So, yes, all these methods are very good. So, the only problem is that um, MEG and the fMRI are very bulky. So, you, you, they use for just special purposes like neuro rehabilitation or to map cortical areas in, in a patient. Okay, and Maria is also wondering are there any job or research opportunities for neuro radiology doctors in neuro tax sphere? I think it's. Uh... Mm. Okay. So I don't see this question, but yes, just email me or Alexei Sanchi and uh, we will think about that. Okay, next question is uh, from Lisa Kurokova. Yes. Uh, can you see it on the screen? Yes. Okay. Uh, so Mikhail is proposing that any electrical fan can be turned in. You know, does he think that's a good? Ah, okay. So. Um, So the question is that you so, propose. So, so uh, I understand this is the opposite direction. Can a BCI help to understand the brain? Well, yeah, most most certainly. So R Richard um, Feynman was um, saying that you understand something only when you can build it. So building a BCI is a, uh, like trying to build the brain. So when you build BCIs, you kind of um, put your hands on the brain. Okay. Mm -hmm. What is next? Uh, is there a systematic review collecting all possible principles of PCI intention detection, invasive or not? 
from Chris. Okay, so I recommend uh, the two reviews. So this is covered uh, by these reviews. I also have a review with uh, Giovanni Mirabella, uh, specifically on BCIs for um, decision making. Okay, so maybe we can provide the, our participants with the link on the website yeah, to yeah. both of these mm -hmm. reviews. Often. Mm -hmm. Nice. Uh, next question is from David Valeriani. Mm -hmm. Where do you see BCIs uh, five, 10 years from now, still in research labs or clinics or as commercial devices available for everyone? Uh, both, yeah, both. Oh. Uh, so, so, yeah, and probably since the technology is developing really rapidly now, so uh, we will see very interesting invasive systems. Yeah, the ones that are very safe, so even a healthy person would like to have something implanted in his brain. Okay. Do you think more companies in neurotech uh, sphere should work on the commercial devices? Uh, absolutely. By, by definition, they work on commercial devices. Yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, our events are also about the interaction between science and industry, how to go from one to another. Yeah, ah, right. So yeah, yeah, it should be um, like real interactions because there are many scientists out there with very good ideas. So and some sometimes these um, uh, business people they have very good business skills, but their ideas may be too simple or too naive. So, mm -hmm. just my advice would be just um, get a real consultation with with the scientists. Do you think scientists are open for such consultations? Absolutely. Yeah, we are all open. Yep. How can one uh, find each other? Uh, just What's the email most effective me. way. Email me. <laughs> so, email. So, Mm -hmm. uh, okay, next question. What are your thoughts about targeting the PNS instead of the CNS uh, in order to reduce the invasiveness? So, um, okay. So, um, a good idea, especially for um, sensor interfaces. And uh, the, um, the most successful sensor interfaces is cochlear implant where you stimulate the cochlea, which is technically um, outside the CNS, right? So, so I may be wrong, but uh, it is still kind of a peripheral stimulation. So when you use peripheral stimulation, then uh, it is guaranteed that the subject will feel something and then there is a higher likelihood um, of successful um, usage of this um, stimulus. Uh, if you go um, like uh, in this brain hierarchy, hierarchy um, like stimulate um, sensory nuclei or sensory cortex, then it is harder for the subject to understand what this means. So, um, so th there are many advantages of peripheral stimulation. Then uh, getting um, getting command signals from um, from, periphery, from the periphery is also convenient in many cases. And I showed that EMGs can be used for this purpose. So for practical reasons, peripheral uh, neural, neural system is um, good enough for, for, um, for these interfaces. But in the other cases, you need to go to the brain. Like if you really want to repair the brain with a certain thing, then go to the brain. So. Uh, to make it um, short, it just depends on the each concrete case. Okay, thanks. Um, we also had some view, uh, some participants on YouTube who watched us there, yes. and okay. we have collected questions from them. Uh, one uh, question is from Martin Dinov. Uh, hey, Dr. Lebedev, have you looked at combining BCIs, uh, for example, through EEG with non-neural, biological, or behavioral signals for the purposes of estimating brain mental state? Non-neural like behaviors. Yeah, this is done all the time. So and of course it needs to go this way. So mm -hmm. um, let me let me give you an example like from this futuristic interfaces where there are 
brain to brain interfaces so the intention is to just uh, to communicate with the brains directly but you have um, still have this um, communication um, uh, means behavioral communication means so why not use them as well so and uh, take um, this cocktail party as an example so uh, it is very noisy, but you still attend to somebody, and this is a mystery how you manage to do this. So here, yeah. brain machine interfaces can help because you will measure which two brains in this party are synchronized to each other. Yeah. So nice. this is your brain neural part, but also look uh, to the person's eyes and you will get more information. Okay, and some some relatedly to the previous question, what do you think about microstates as a unifying framework for understanding global brain dynamics? Ah, yeah, I fully yeah fully support uh, this kind of yeah, research. Yeah. Um, okay. Another question from YouTube: uh, Can we really say that each electrode in the Utah array is recording from an individual neuron? Isn't it more? LFP-like signal from a neighborhood that then individual neuron? Ah, it, it records both. So it records, so if you are lucky, you record nice single cells. You, if you are not so lucky, you record uh, um, multi-unit activity. So several neurons, like from 10 to maybe hundreds. Mm -hmm. And if you are completely unlike, uh, unlucky, then you um, still can record local field potentials. Okay. Which may not be so bad for certain purposes. Okay. Uh, there's another question from Lisa. Um, there was a quick jump from invasive monkey walking BCI to non-invasive human walking BCI. Uh, the latter does not directly follow from the former different animal, different technology, different signals, etc. Could you talk more about adapting insights from invasive animal humans experiments to non-invasive ones? Maybe you can talk in the neurobar. From invasive to non-invasive. Mm, uh, so uh, like what I can say is that um, invasive people love these uh, single units or multi-unit activity and th they very rarely record local field potentials mm -hmm. in the, this field activity, which is very useful and it is all what non-invasive people use. So the merger could be in, in like talking to each other and um, figuring out how this uh, field potentials relate to unit activity and um, what, um, what kind of different information could be extracted from these signals. Uh, so next question is more about non-invasive history. Uh, as mentioned in the video, there are plenty of non-invasive devices on the market. Uh, is there an industry standard, so to say seal of approval that a device can receive as a confirmation of its quality? Yeah, so, I, um, I, I don't know for sure, but to me it looks like that there are just minimal um, levels of standard and uh, what a consumer usually gets is not what a neurophysiologist a physiologist would like to get. For example, if I get a recording device, I would uh, like to have an option just to look at the signals because I will immediately see like this channel has an artifact, this channel is contaminated by EMG activity, you know, something like this. So. Consumers do not get this, so and then this um, this make makes um, these devices um, less useful for them. So I don't know what the solution is. So, but as this develops, probably good solutions will be. We will see better solutions. Okay. Uh, next question for, from Mikhail Bilov. Uh, when and how do we manage to enter information into the brain? So already, um, now that I showed several examples of experiments, you can send information to the monkey brain. Uh, rats may be even better for this because they learn uh, really quickly when you um, send information um, to the brain. 
In monkeys, uh, recently it was shown by Mark Schieber and his colleagues that you can send information to a traditionally non-sensory area, which is a premortem cortex. You send information to premortem cortex, the monkey learns. So it is starting to look uh, that uh, practically any area of the brain is a good entrance point for sending information to the brain. So um, I am actually surprised why this is not um, developing rapidly in humans and um, some even restrictive measures have been developed because, um, uh, be because when you stimulate the brain, it is uh, a different problem compared to um, decoding information from the brain. When you decode, you um, try to understand the brain code, but it is not known. When you send information to the brain, you send the ele electrical signals to the brain, and this is the brain's job to figure out what this means. So if, if it is even a kind of a very gross um, uh, signal, unusual, the brain will figure this out, and e eventually it will um, learn how to use it. So and uh, there are um, places where you can motivate a human, so potentially, all this needs regulation because you don't need um, elect electrical stimulation addicts, for example. Okay. So, but I think, uh, yeah, systems like this will develop pretty rapidly. Uh, actually, we have we still have uh, around twenty questions. Okay. Uh, so let me just. If you have okay. Uh, but can you read yourself, or in order to make it faster? Ah, okay, what are the promising areas on BCI technology to study? So to me, uh, this ma material science looks very promising. So these um, implants are developing really um, rapidly. So like uh, whoever manages to safely record uh, lots of neural signals in the brain will get um, an advantage in this field. Uh, I like to... Uh, yeah, it's about contacting you, but you already okay, mentioned that yeah. just email. email. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So have you tried to use hardware decoders? Uh, no, but yeah, but this is, yeah, uh, this definitely can be done. So just if you are so sure in your software, decode make it uh, hardware. Uh, could you go into more depth? Uh, more depth about the apneas? Ah, so these uh, near infrared are interesting because um, uh, let's say, let's compare with EEG. Uh, for EEG, there are some, uh, mm, some ways to decode, which everybody likes, like based on mu rhythm, but uh, FNIRS gives you other ways, like you can um, take a square root of something and then your prefrontal cortex will become active. So you, you, you could use different um, ways of, you know, of imagery or um, activity to control these interfaces. Although they are slow and maybe not, um, yeah. not so like informative, but- But, but they, seeing that they are developing now, Yes, uh, quite rapidly. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think it's it will be possible to achieve this in special A and D temporal resolution at the same time with non-invasive BCI in the future? Um, mm, so probably no, unless some um, discovery is made that makes a revolution in this non-invasive field, yeah. like you have a device that it records mm -hmm. brain activity really well. Uh, what's your opinion on non-invasive BCI neurofeedback? Ah, yeah, that's very promising field. Um, so, be, um, because uh, both invasive and non-invasive neurofeedback is interesting because um, here you get an indicator of the activity of your own brain. So normally you don't know what's going on in different areas of, of your brain. Now you you have it and you can try to control it. So you could use this to um, treat neurological disorders or maybe to improve in some normal skills. Yeah, but I think this question is also because there is a lot of 
criticism to non-invasive BCI neurofeedback. Uh, in the mm. papers, it's not they are not consistent and so on and so forth. Uh, could be, but yeah, read uh, read our papers. <laughs> so, so yeah, there will be more. So yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it is good to record EG with minimum electrodes for BCI. Ah, with minimum electrodes, it, it all depends on on your purpose. Like if it is um, non-invasive uh, EEG that uses, I don't know, alpha rhythm that probably don't need too many electrodes. But if you want to resolve some fine grade features of the signal, that more more electrodes would help. Okay. What's your view on using invasive neural interfaces to enhance human performance from an ethics perspective? Uh, so, um, uh, my view is that they should become safer. This is uh, one point uh, uh, for making them useful for the people. And regarding this intruding in the person's mind, uh, uh, I think uh, this is a problem both for invasive and non-invasive interfaces. So, so th there is nothing special, yeah. special with the invasive in this aspect. Uh, what do you think about the future of non-invasive BCIs for inner speech decoding? Non-invasive. Yeah. So. This I don't know, but uh, yeah, it can be used in some particular um, situations, but uh, I suspect that still still you want mm, a high information transfer rate. Yeah, okay. this one you can get with uh, invasive methods. Uh, next question, what could be a good feedback reference to tune decoders in the study emotions in humans or monkeys? What's a good uh, reference a literacy reference? In decoders, the study motion. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, exactly. There, there are interfaces for emotions. I even um, I know at least one paper where they suggested just record emotions in an emotion area, and if the emotions are not so good, mm -hmm. self stimulate yourself. So. Session. In this way, you cope with depression. Okay. And, and actually, there will be a competition between uh, drug approaches and, um, and so pharmaceutical approaches and... in this uh, sphere. Mm -hmm. um, ten questions more, and we're done. Mm -hmm. okay. I read about an electrode array on the tongue as a BC interface used in a lab in USA. Yes. What do you think about this solution, feasibility and possibilities? So, so this is called sensory substitution, where you do not go like to the brain, but you use some kind of um, natural sensation or almost natural sensation like stimulation of the tongue. And in this case, they wanted to give people new vision. So yeah, this is a valid approach. And uh, also, as uh, this recent paper where they uh, recorded uh, sensations from the brain and stimulated on the skin surface, so uh, so merge of the two approaches would be really good. I myself okay. didn't, didn't try the stimulation of the tongue, so I, I, I cannot tell how, how it feels and how good it is. Did you have an opportunity to try or you no, didn't I want? Didn't. Okay. So maybe someone can um offer you if okay. you're interested okay mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in case of missing limb do you think it's possible to take signals for controlling a robotic prosthesis directly from the spinal cord uh yeah yeah uh, so but the, the, uh, this um, the work with the spinal cord is hard because it is um, it moves it moves so if mm -hmm. you insert an electrode in the spinal cord mm -hmm. and then perform a movement you can damage the spinal cord so some kind of very flexible electrodes should be moved and then both recording from the spinal cord and stimulation of the spinal cord could be very helpful uh, can we effectively influence attentional processes with BCI? 
Yes, and uh, I even co-authored a, a review on BCI's for attention. So th there is hope that uh, BCI's could improve attention, mm -hmm. and uh, they could be even used with, in people with attention deficit disorder. Okay, yeah, for educational purposes, for example. Uh, yeah, I, educational j just for for yourself to to be to learn yeah. how to control attention. Yeah. Uh, what's your opinion on holistic approach, not just brain, but whole body? Ah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, like okay. um, brain, then it connects to the spinal cord, then the spinal cord connects to everything. So mm -hmm. like, uh, take for example, the spinal cord and the brain. The only difference is that there is a long axon that connects the two neurons, but just mentally shorten this axon, it's the same thing. So, um, so basically in the human body, everything is interconnected and the neural si system innervates everything, innervates every organ of the body and every organ of the body sends um, signals to the brain. So, mm -hmm. so it is all, all together. Um, which of the ensemble paradigms described in the presented article is most promising for non-invasive BCI recognition signal? Uh, I think this is a reference to one of the articles presented in the... So, um, ensemble paradigm regarding non-invasive recordings, then um, you, you should look into some kind of multi-channel recordings. So say you are recording with 128 um, EG channels, so which will which give you sort of an ensemble activity. And now you apply the same principles. So mm -hmm. the more channels you record, the better you get in, in decoding. Uh, there is a question about uh, models. So can you tell something on the models, linear, Kalman based and neural networks? But so, uh, like, um, if you um, um, want to uh, use a model and still have a good um, understanding of what's going on, use a simpler model, like a linear model. But then if you uh, want a good performance, then um, use a neural network. But uh, there is a risk that at some point you will lose understanding what exactly it does, but maybe this is not a, such a high risk because when this model is designed, then you can design it in, in a such way in such a way that you understand how, how, how it works. But, but neural networks are really promising in this sense. The, the only, the only um, caution, warning that I will give is that uh, when you use neural networks, let's say for image recognition, you know that there is an image there. When you use it to recognize um, electrical activity of the brain, this electricity, electrical activity yeah. of the brain is a sort of epiphenomenon. It is not designed for you uh, like an image. So it may be too noisy uh, and uh, no algorithm will decode it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, next question. I'm working on design and development of an application to increase concentration level using non-invasive BCI. You have shown the paper where they found that their alpha duration and amplitude rate did not change mm -hmm. as concentration level works on alpha and beta band. So is my study going to be useless or could you suggest okay, anything? Okay, one second. Uh, that's a nice question. Okay, so so that paper showed that alpha episode duration is constant and the amplitude is constant. And what you are changing is the frequency uh, of these alpha episodes. So, and this was one particular type of feedback. Now, uh, it appears that if you play with feedback latency, then you can also change um, uh, 
duration and amplitude. And uh, when you do this, uh, think about uh, it in terms of apparent conditioning. So basically, you have some signal and you reward something in the signal and then the reward signal should arrive to the brain at certain time. So if it arrives a little bit late, then you have maybe a better chance to change uh, uh, this um, duration and, and amplitude, but still maybe you should just um, better understand what kind of signal you're trying uh, to control and what you mean exactly by this increase in concentration. And then if you understand better what ALF um, spindles mean in relationship to concentration, then, then you're not wasting your time. Just get a better understanding of the neurological, neuro, neurophysiological phenomenon that you are operating with. So you think that there's no need to throw into the trash bin uh, run adapters uh, work? So the uh, what kind of adapters? Uh, no, no, no. Uh, yeah, <laughs> let's just skip it. I was just saying that you, what you said means that there's no no need to throw it away, throw it to... No, 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 just get a better understanding, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, another question from YouTube and two more and we're done. Okay. Uh, how difficult or easy would it be for cellular electrophysiologists working on rodent in vitro slice recordings to move to the field of BCI research? Ah, no, not difficult at all. And actually, um, uh, if you have uh, skills in a different field, uh, then you can bring your skills and uh, develop new ideas. So, so yeah, so this is really, especially that these um, technologies for recordings are getting better and better and maybe there's uh, Cell uh, electrophysiologist, uh, electrophysiology will be what you operate with uh, with brain machine interfaces. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think about the neuroscience as a service platform recently launched by Kernel? Mm -hmm. uh, if you already read, uh, I read that they, they invented a really advanced helmet, but I haven't read about this service platform. Okay. Service for, did you read? And not really, but uh, we hope that we'll have kernel in one of the day as a special guest. Ah, okay, okay. The, the, Maybe, the, the, we're the, not sure, the, yeah. The uh, better. Hopefully. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So anyone, for, everyone from the uh, participants today can push kernel to participate. Mm -hmm. uh, as well as Elon Musk. Um, yeah, and last question uh, from, from, the, from the participants for PCI control, what is the proper model? Uh, I think it's regarding, uh, yeah. Uh, the proper model is first, uh, it, the model becomes proper when you know what you want to control, right? Mm -hmm. And then uh, if you have a good choice of the signal to do this control, and if you provide the subject with a good feedback, and if you good, uh, use a good decoder, and then um, looks like that uh, these uh, deep learning algorithms are really powerful, so use them. Okay, uh, Mikhail, are you okay if I ask you uh, two more questions from previous session yesterday? Okay. Uh, that from YouTube, okay. but I had no chance to answer. Yeah, sure. Um, what what are they are like more general? What are fundamental scientific or engineering problems which stop us from making powerful BCI a fully functional interface between conscious thoughts and computational power of machine? Okay, so um, still the, uh, the major problem um, is that we cannot record uh, brain activity well enough. So like mm -hmm. uh, with invasive interfaces, uh, one hopes that you will be able to record from millions of neurons. And, uh, but you cannot do this now because you implant, then your electrode gets encapsulated and you just um, have um, 
not so good activity. Uh, with non-invasive, uh, there is a fundamental problem that uh, there is a limit of signal quality. But let's imagine for one second uh, that we resolve this problem and uh, that we can record very nicely from millions of single cortical neurons. Mm -hmm. Now the problem uh, becomes uh, how do you decode uh, all this immense activity? And it, it is not clear at all. Probably we need better theories of how the brain works, mm -hmm. what these signals mean. And uh, so um, probably we will advance in this, um, in this area. So I, I think that in these sensory interfaces that, uh, that send information directly to the brain, we will have even more advances uh, than in, in the ones that um, decode. Uh, the decoding ones will be developing slowly. But with the um, sensory interfaces, probably we will see real interesting um, applications like uh, interfaces for restoration of vision, Mm -hmm. Even interfaces for creation of new sensations, like uh, interfaces that create new qualias. Mm -hmm. So in then uh, you invaded the, the consciousness of a person yeah. with uh, uh, so machine such intelligence. As for, uh, such as, for example, you can uh, feel the uh, stock uh, trademarks, so how stock goes up or not. How you feel? sensation. Ah, uh, yeah. yeah, you Definitely. you put a jacket uh, when you feel the information comes from your Twitter. I don't know. So, uh, like a quality of a stock market. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Kind of. Um, what should the scientists focus on to be on the same wavelengths with the BCI creators? Uh, can you repeat this? What? Uh, the question is, what should the scientists focus on now to be on the same wavelengths? with the BCI creators. It's oh. like there's- What kind of scientists? Any scientists? Let's say, yeah, if you are a young researcher or- Ah, okay. So because BCI field yeah. is by definition a multidisciplinary, so mm -hmm. uh, nearly any kind of scientist can join, like physicist, chemist, uh, engineer, medical um, person surgeon anyway yeah so i think question is about, uh, about the previous talk where we had uh, G uh, christoph guga and mm -hmm. uh, guy from open bci and uh, emotive mm -hmm. and uh, one can can see that um, there are more in uh, industry and some people are more in science so in order to for for both of these groups of people to be more coherent let's say and you know to more to work productively mm -hmm. uh, the question is what should scientists focus on or what do so um, the scientists probably should focus on science because at the end this is will be the most valuable <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> the other parts will come in a natural way so the, uh, the other parts i think are simpler than science yeah, and uh, one question from our team, uh, because we also have a lot of young scientists and researchers or just enthusiasts uh, from across the globe. Uh, in your opinion, what should a young researcher keep in mind while working in neurotech field to be successful or what one needs to be aware of if you make uh, your first steps? Uh, so, oh. Okay, to be successful. So yeah, one, once again, just read uh, lots of literature, read the most papers, um, try to detect the trends, and then, then, then this will help. Okay, maybe participate in such events like. Oh, oh, oh absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, this was the last question for today. Uh, thank you very much for your answers. Okay. I hope you're not tired. Um, no, uh, are you going to to be in the newer bar later yes. today? Uh -huh. We can probably discuss some more in there. Uh, okay. For for those who are still listening, thank you for your participation. Sorry for a bit, uh, not a bit actually, a delay in our 
a timetable. Uh, we'll, uh, the guys will open the bar in 15 minutes after uh, I stop this, uh, this talk. Uh, it's just a time for you to grab a drink or the drink if you like to, to have some. Yeah, it can be both alcoholic or non-alcoholic, uh, depends on your time zone, I, I think, or and your internal um, uh, will. Uh, let's meet in 15 minutes after this uh, stops in the newer bar. Uh, let's thank Mikhail again by raising your hand. <laughs> yeah, just to entertain some. Yeah, thank you. So the link will be provided in uh, uh, Neurotech X Slack, but I think we'll send you uh, your special guest in, in today's bar. Okay. So, so much, uh, Not yet. I okay. just stopped now. Uh, you